started in the book of Genesis where God goes to Adam and Eve and he makes a promise to them and he gives them a mandate and they were in Eden and we know that they blew it. And then, so when God shows up to spend some time with Adam and Eve, he doesn't show up knowing they blew it. He didn't show up with a spanking spoon. Instead, he shows up with pen and paper and he says, you know what? I'm ready to rewrite the contract. I'm ready to reestablish my promise with you, Adam. I'm ready to re establish my promise with you, Eve. And so Eve is there and he tells Eve, he says, listen, out of your seed will come one, will come a redeemer and he will come and he will fix all that you messed up and he will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. He's actually prophesying to the serpent. He says a, a Messiah, a redeemer, not just redemption, but a redeemer will come and he will crush your skull. You'll bruise his heel. You put him on the cross, but he will defeat the cross and he will crush all authority in your life. And listen, we know that this is the promise that Jesus came and fulfilled. That promise that he made long ago to Eve. And then we know last from last week, we talked about the Noahic covenant and how Noah was on the scene after this. And they were still experiencing the effects of sin and the fallout of that. And God looks at the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And he said, you know what? We're just going to have to kind of almost start all the way over. But I remember I made a promise to Adam and Eve. So I can't get rid of everybody. But what I'll do is I'll flood the earth and I'll preserve for me someone who has faith. A man named Noah. And he saw Noah and he said, man, oh, Noah, I am reestablishing my covenant with you. And so as Noah gets out of that ark, he begins... He, offers a sacrifice and God enters in to another covenant with mankind and it looked just like the previous one he said I want you to go and subdue the earth and take over the earth and humans are important and life is valuable and after he does that we know that God put that rainbow in the sky in, 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 the, in the Hebrew language the word isn't rainbow the word is bow and understanding that the bow at that time was not a weapon that was pointed at animals it wasn't a hunting device it was actually a device that was used for violence because they, they didn't eat, eat meat at that time at, at this time was when God said you could eat meat praise the Lord thank you Lord for that amendment to the covenant and he said now you can eat some meat so now you can use your bows for this but this is what God this is what it says, is that God said, I will never, ever flood the earth again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that bow and I'm going to set it down. I'm going to set it down in the clouds so you can look up at that thing that used to be a tool of violence. Now you can look at it and know that it is a picture and an image of my mercy and my goodness. And these are the promises that God is making to his people. And we're focusing on Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to declare this with me today. Let us hold tightly. Come on, declare it with me. Let us hold tightly. Let's declare that again. Ready? Come on, you can do better than that. Let us hold tightly to the promise, to the hope that we affirm. I messed it up. Let's, let's start over again. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Amen. Aren't you glad that God can be trusted? And today, what I'm going to attempt to do and I felt like I did it okay during first service. I think I can do it better with more response uh, during second service is that, is that I'm going to try to weave in three narratives and kind of mess up our originally scheduled program. We're going we're to talk about Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant today, but I'm going to talk about how that affects today. Today is Pentecost, and so I'm going to weave that into this narrative today. So after Noah gets off the ark, time's continue and the earth does what it always does the the world goes dark the world goes distant from god once again like always we just have a really good way of screwing up perfection and so man instead of doing what god had told noah and adam is man says you know what let's not scatter the earth let's not go around and spread the dominion of god let's just let's just get together we we need to be together we just we just need to be together. And so what we want to be is we want to be famous. We want to be recognized. And we want to be independent. We want to, be, we want to find safety in what we can build. And so they build this tower called Babel. You guys are familiar with this, right? So they build this tower called Babel. And people will say, well, what, what was the sin of Babel? Weren't they trying to get to God? I don't know that they were trying to get to God. I think that they were, they were in their works, they were trying to to make themselves famous. And they were trying to disobey the Lord. They were really in direct disobedience because God had told them to go to the nations. And here they were saying, we're not going to go. We just, we enjoy the safety. So first of all, the sin was disobedience. Disobedience to, to, to multiply and fill the earth. 
Let's, let's not go anywhere. Let's just, let's just stay in the comfort of our own city. In fact, let's build our own city. And then the second sin is the sin of pride. They said, you know what? Let, let us do it. We can do it. And, and we'll be famous. And everybody will know who we are. We, we want the praise of man. And the third thing that we see is their independence. They say, let's build a city. Let's build a city so we can provide for ourselves. It, trusting God is too difficult. Why don't we just do it on our own? So God looks. In Genesis chapter 11, he looks upon these people that are doing their own thing, independent of God, rebellious towards God. He looks at the people and he said, man, as one people speak in the same language, nothing they do will be impossible for them. All the things that they set out to do, they'll accomplish. So you know what I'll do? I'll confuse their language. And so God looks and he confuses their language. And God scatters them. God says, I'll do the multiplying, I guess. Because I can't trust you to do it. So God sends them all over the earth. And that's where their, their languages were changed. And in the midst of all these people he sends out, God sees a man named Abram. And he looks at Abram and he says, I'll pick him. I'm going to use him to produce the seed that I promised Eve. I'm going to use him to continue what I promised Noah. They keep messing up. I'll, I'm not going to destroy them. I'll scatter them. But of all those that are scattered, I'm going to use this one man. And from that man, he will establish the line that will produce the Jewish people, the most significant people in human history. I will establish the, the Jewish people, and out of those people will come the great Redeemer. And he will come from that line. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, he comes to Abram, and he makes a promise. He makes a covenant. The Lord said to Abraham, leave. Oh, <laughs> but we want to stay. It's so cozy. Leave. Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go. Everybody say go. Go, go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Abram, you can't do it on your own. I'll do it. But you got to trust me to do it. I know you've been trying to be great in your own, but I'll make you great if you'll trust me. I will bless you, and I will make you famous. You won't have to pursue fame. Now, we're talking about a different kind of fame. You won't have to pursue the, the fame and the praise of men. I will make you famous in my eyes. And you will be, listen, and your fame will be based upon the glory of God. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless all the nations of the world through you, Abraham. And so God makes a covenant with Abraham. It's in three parts, pretty simple. And it's first this is dominion. The same thing. Here it is again. The same thing he promised to Adam. The same thing he promised to Noah is the same thing he's pro promised to Abraham. The same thing that Jesus promised to us. The dominion of a king. The dominion of a king. The original mandate. So Abraham, what did he have to do to expand that dominion? Dominion. He had to leave the comfort. He had to get out of the house. Come on. And we love our comfort so much. We're like, well, doesn't God want me to be comfortable? No. He wants you to be comforted. And if you're not uncomfortable, you won't ever need the comforter. And he wants to comfort you, but you're so busy comforting yourself and putting pillowcases on, doing all your precautionary measures so you don't have to live by faith. And God is saying, I want you to live risky. And I will comfort you. So he does. He leaves. Abraham's a rich man. He says, I want you to leave all of it. The second thing that he promises Abraham is descendants. I will make you a great nation. Abraham's like 75 years old. <laughs> Lord, in case you haven't checked lately. <laughs> Intimacy around the Abram house isn't, isn't very frequent. Not a young man anymore, Lord. And Sarah, well, yeah. How's that going to work? But we know that in this, God changes his name from Abram, which means father, to Abraham, which means father of many nations. You guys, some of y'all that grew up in church, you know a song about that, right? Father Abraham, right? Had many sons, and many sons had father Abraham. 
I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right, left, no, whatever arm, right? So we know, we know that song. What, what are we saying? We're talking about Abraham, that the, that the nations of the earth would be blessed, that there would be an inheritance that would come from him that wasn't even from his loins. They would actually come from faith. And the third promise that God gives Abraham is this promise of blessing. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't, I just want to bless you, Abraham. I just want to love on you. He does. But I don't want to just bless you. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. See, you're so focused on the blessing of God happening to you. That's not what you, that's why you're not seeing it. Because listen, God wants to get the blessing through you. And listen, blessing gets on you as it goes through you. So just understand that if I will see myself as a vehicle for the blessing of God, God will make sure I'm blessed. It's going to get on me. But some of you are so focused on your preservation and your fulfillment of your own and your being happy that you're not finding your pleasure in the will of God. That's the reason why you're not happy. If you will find your pleasure in the will of God, that's what blessing is. It's pleasure in the midst of the will of God. If you will find that, if that will be the goal of your life, you'll be happy. But you've got to find it in the dependence. If blessing only blesses you, it becomes a curse. Some of you are fat with blessing. Why won't God give me more? Because that's not blessing. It's materialism. That's not blessing. That's covetousness. That's not blessing. It's greed. Why do you want more? Because you want to be comfortable. Mm. And God's saying, I want to bless the nations through you. I want to bless that little boy in Haiti through you. I want to bless that man over there that don't have a sandwich to eat today through you. I want to bless that man that has fear in his heart right now through you. But you're too caught up with your opinion that you can't get your eyes off yourself. See, Abraham is a prototype of promise. He shows us what promise looks like. He shows us the pattern, the formula, really, if you'll track with me, a promise. We don't like the word formula, but, but really, he's a pattern. He's a prototype of promise. Check this out, Galatians chapter 3. How many of y'all are Jewish descendants? Anybody? Oh, we have one, a couple. I'm not a Jewish descendant. I don't think so. How would all the nations of the earth be blessed through the promise of Abraham? Galatians 3, 29. You belong to Christ. You are the true the true children of Abraham. See, when Jesus was on the earth, they were like, we're the children of Abraham. We're the, we're the descendants of Abraham. Jesus is like, you're the child of the devil. He said, those that, that's exactly what he said. He said, those that come to me are the true children of Abraham. It's not about a law that you keep. It's about a faith that you hold. You belong to Christ. You are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. You inherit the promises of Abraham. God's promises to Abraham belong to you. So guess what? Those three things are promises to you. Dominion. What, is, what, what does God have dominion over that's not being played out in your life? Do you have a temper? The dominion of God is not in your temper. Do you have a sexual addiction through internet pornography? The dominion of God has not taken place in your life. What do you need to rule over? What do you need to rule over? You lose your cool in traffic every single day? It's because you haven't taken dominion over your attitude. It's, ah, it's such a small thing. Not to God. It's a big thing. He wants you to, he, he paid a high price for you to be able to have the fruit of the Spirit. Come on. Let's just be real. I didn't mean to get all heavy today, but here we are. You are his heirs. And what God promised Abraham, listen, you need dominion. You need descendants. You need to experience that house of the open womb miracle. Come on, baby. It's yours. It was promised to Abraham to a woman who was barren, who was old in age, who could not naturally have children. And God said, I'm going to bless her. I'm going to bless the nations of the world. That's a closed room. We've had people that never had a period in their life and get pregnant. 
God said, I'll open those wombs because I promised you descendants. And some of you only want physical descendants, but God wants to give you spiritual descendants. How many disciples have you raised up? That's not the pastor's job. That's the Christian's job. Y'all okay? I was just going to preach for a little bit. All right. So the blood covenant, this is the covenant. So God says, I promise you all these things. These are, listen, these are the benefits, Abraham, if you will get with me. But let me, let me kind of play out. Because he's a prototype of promise, let's talk about what promise looks like. Abraham enters what's called a blood covenant. There's several covenants throughout the scriptures. We might or might not get to those during this series. But a blood covenant has several elements to it. First of all, it has the parties involved. Like when you got married, there's two parties involved. No, no more than that, just that person. Right? That'll probably be showing up questioning in the next couple of years two two parties two parties and they're not just parties they're partners covenant is a partnership god's promises listen to me beloved there's a lot of doctrine that's like it's just all god and it's just you don't have any part to play and you're just a measly little sinner and you, you, your, your whole life is just submitted to the lord absolutely your whole life is submitted to the lord but not as a sinner come on not as a servant but as a friend god saying i want friends i want covenant partners the theme of the scriptures is covenant and god says i want people that won't just be robots and peons i want partners i want people to promise I don't want pawns on my chess game. I want kings and queens. I want partners. I want people that are like me. That's what you were created, beloved, in the image of God. Why do you think? So you can rule and reign with God. Not for your agendas. Not for your fatness. But there's a party. There's a partnership. There's a role to play. Oh, brother, it's just all God. And he's looking at unity. He's going, it's all you. I'm done what I can do. I've already paid the price on the cross. What are you doing with it? I've already given you the power of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with the fruit of the Spirit? It's a partnership. It's a stewardship. The second thing is the terms of agreement. Gosh, I'm just trying to get through this. The terms of agreement. The terms of agreement. What are the terms of agreement? When you go and sign your house, you say, I'm going to pay my house payment on the first of every month. You sign an agreement. These are the terms. This is what you got to do. You got to keep insurance on your house, blah, 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 right? You know, you know. Well, when you get into a covenant, there's terms. And the Abrahamic covenant, which is the same as the new covenant, it's a reestablishment of that, is that there are terms. But there's only two terms. There's not, you say, well, the term come out. No, no, just two terms. It's two terms. Faith and friendship. Faith and and friendship, what's faith mean? Believe in the truth, fairy? No, it means trust, active trust. That you're living in trust, that you're willing to leave that land and go to the land I will show you. That's trust. And there's friendship. That means closeness, nearness, relationship. So like Noah, Abraham was righteous. Not because of what he did, but because of his faith. And because of his faith, he obeyed. See, me all think I got to obey to please God. No, you got to have faith to please God, and then you'll obey. If you're not obeying, it's because you don't have faith. Don't get it backwards. James 2, 23. Abraham believed God. He just believed him. Will you believe God? Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Just like Noah, because of his faith. Not because of his deeds. Because of his faith. Not because he was a good person. Because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. He was, he was so caught up in resting in God, he became well acquainted with the Lord. He became well acquainted with Yahweh. So has the parties involved, the terms of agreement, and then there's a ceremony. There's a ceremony to a blood covenant. So like, this is the deal. We're the ones here. This is, this is the terms of the agreement, and this is what the ceremony looks like. Just like when you got married to your spouse, or one day when you do, come on, come on. You need to be fruitful and multiply. Let's do it the right way, right? Come on. So you get in that covenant. You get in that marriage covenant. When I do weddings, I don't, I, that's what I call it. I call it a marriage covenant. There's the vows involved, and there's the ceremony, right? So it says this in Genesis 15. Let's look at this. The Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer. <laughs> Love that. A three-year-old female goat. And a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. 
So Abram, before he was Abraham, presented all these things to him and killed them. He sacrificed them. And he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. And this, I love verse 11. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abraham chased them away. So can you imagine, I mean, the picture, he's like presenting his sacrifice. He's laying it out there. There's blood everywhere, and vultures are, are swirling, trying to steal his sacrifice. Oh, come on. Trying to take away what he's presenting to the Lord so a covenant can be made. And here's old Abraham running around. Hey, you got hurt, you know, old man. So funny. It's such a funny picture of my mind. I just see that. I'm like, yes, so good. Get him, Abraham. And then in verse 12 through 16, God starts laying out what the next 400 years are, are going to look like. He talks about Joseph and Moses and gets into kind of what, what, what it's going to look like. And so after this, this is the ceremony. Again, he cuts these things. And after this, the sun went down and darkness fell. So there's a period of time here. And Abraham saw a smoking fire pot. Check this out. This is so awesome. He saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the covenant. He saw this fire, there's blood everywhere, and he sees this, this fire begin to go. God walking through the blood. God walking through the sacrifice. How is he showing up? The same way he showed up in the desert with the children of Israel. He came as a fire. The same way he showed up with Moses when God calls him. He says, I'll show up as a fire. The same way he shows up in Acts chapter 2. He said, I'm going to show up in the midst of the sacrifice as a fire. As a fire, I'm here. I'm an all-consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12. Here I am. And so the Lord made a covenant. Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham that day. Abram that day. And said, I will give you this land to your descendants. I will give this land to your descendants. So what do we have? We have a covenant. We have a ceremony. A cutting of animals laid. What, what would happen in those days? And maybe we'll get into this a little bit deeper. But they would, they would walk between the, the flesh, they would walk there. In fact, that word covenant actually, barit, is actually means to walk between flesh to the point of agreement. And they would walk through, and, and some would say that they would start off walking between that flesh back to back. And after they walked around, they would circle around, and they would end up face to face. So here's Abraham seeing God saying, here I go. Abraham, you better get over here. I'm walking through. And they would end up face to face. Listen. How many of you know that a sacrifice was made 2,000 years ago so God could cut covenant with man? This was prophesying of nobody other than the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace, the God who wants to make peace, who wants to cut covenant, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. See, Jesus Jesus' body was torn open so that you could be in relationship with God, so that you could be in partnership with God, not so you could just be some weird robot. And then the next thing that happens, there would be a, a seal of that covenant. There would be a, a symbol. We see it with, with Adam, which I believe was the, the animal that he sacrificed, and then he gives him the permanent clothing. It was a, every time he looked at that, he said, God made a promise. I got my, got my lambskin underwear on, right? God made a promise. It's a little softer than those fig leaves. It lasts a little longer. And with Noah, we see that God put that bow in the, in the heavens. Put my bow down. What, so now every time when it starts raining and your kids are afraid, you can look at it and say, God keeps his promises. Right. With Abraham... <laughs> You know what the sign of covenant was? Circumcision. Oh, awkward. <laughs> so every time a young man yeah, he remembers. Hopefully he doesn't remember the pain involved. All right. So in the, in the new covenant, we have what we just did a little bit earlier. We have communion. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The blood that I have shed. Come on, remember the blood of forgiveness. Remember the passage that you have. Remember my body was broken. 
Remember that I am the sacrificial lamb. When you do this, do it in remembrance of me. We have that. But we have a second symbol. We have a second symbol of the new covenant. We have the symbol of the Holy Spirit. who's not just a symbol, but he is present in our lives. Hebrews 10, 15, it says, and the Holy Spirit who testifies. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? He said, he will remind you of everything that I've said. Listen, the Holy Spirit will testify. He'll say, look at what Jesus did. That's what it is for. He says, this is the new covenant I will make with the people of that day. And then he establishes, he talks about the new covenant from Ezekiel. He says, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them upon their minds. In other words, I am going to get inside of them and I'm going to teach them how to live. Not from a distant list, but from a present helper. I'm going to be in their life. See, the Holy Spirit is the fire that passed through the covenant that day, who passed on the blood that day. Listen, the Holy Spirit is the fire that passed through the covenant, and it marked us. We're totally transformed. John the Baptist prophesied of it. Do you remember John the Baptist, what he said? He said, hey, I'm, I'm baptizing you. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the forgiveness of sins, but somebody's coming after me. Someone who's coming after me I'm not even worthy of, he's going to come, and he's going to baptize you with fire. And then Jesus in Acts chapter 1, he commanded them. How about that? He commanded them, don't leave Jerusalem until, until the Father sends you the gift he promised. Until the Father sends you the gift he promised, the gift that will be a constant reminder of not how bad you are, but how much Jesus paid and how much God loves you and how much you were on his mind. I will put the Holy Spirit in you to remind you of the goodness of God. And I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized. You will be submerged in the Holy Spirit. See, some of you have been touched by the Holy Spirit, but you haven't been immersed in the Holy Spirit. You haven't been submerged in the Holy Spirit. We call that being baptized in the Holy Ghost. For those of you that like that old language, I like it. I don't want no ghost. Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. It'll change everything. It will change everything. He will change everything. So we call this experience that Jesus prophesies, that Jesus promises in Acts chapter 1, we call this experience Pentecost. That's why we're talking about this today. Some other things we need to talk about, but that's why we're talking about this today because in Acts chapter 2, it was a prophecy that was being fulfilled that was written back to the prophet Joel chapter 2 verse 28. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all. All flesh, all the people of the earth we bless through you. I'm going to do it. The word Pentecost, penta means 50. Pentecost was a celebration of 50 days after the children of Israel, Exodus, and then they had the covenant on Sinai. It's a mark of that. Oh, we can go there real good. We're not going to. But there are Pentecostals in the Bible. I know when you think Pentecostal, you think, hey, how long their hair is, how short their hair is, how much makeup they wear. Come on. Dresses only, shouting, Blues Brothers, right? <laughs> Come on. So we have Blues Brothers. Where, where does Blues? Look it up. See, Pentecost empowers us with a person so that we can fulfill our part of the partnership. Let me say that one more time because I don't think that you got it. See, Pentecost empowers us with a person so that we can fill our, fulfill our part of the partnership. You say, well, I, I'm having a hard time living for God. I'm having a hard time living for Jesus. I guess I just need to be more disciplined. No, what you need is more of the Holy Ghost in your life. What you need more is more of the fire and the presence of God. That's what you need. You need Him. You need Him to obey Him. So we start seeing at this moment what God had promised Abraham. 2,000 years before this. We see dominion. We see descendants. Look, Acts 1.8. Jesus said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Dunamis, explosive power. And you'll be my witnesses. You'll be my martyrs 
telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea, through Samaria, and through the ends of the earth. You won't even be willing to live for me. You'll be willing to die for me all over the earth. Dominion and descendants. And the third thing that we see is the fulfillment of that is blessing. Joel 2. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is later quoted in Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up and says, this is that, what Joel was talking about. All flesh. Everyone's going to receive the gospel because you're empowered from on high. Acts 2, verse 1, the blessing, all people will be blessed. So when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. They were together like we're together today. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came through heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Oh, Lord, do it here. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were already believers, but now they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And now there were some Jews staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation. They were just all living out there. They were coming to the day of Pentecost to celebrate. They didn't know what they were celebrating. They knew a portion of it. But the Pentecost is about to take on a whole new meaning. And when they heard this sound, whoo, there's a sound coming. And it won't just be tongues. It'll be shouts. It'll be declarations of the glory of God. Listen, some of you just need to learn to shout a little more. Well, that's not my personality. That's fine. It's not about you. It wasn't my person. It wasn't my personality. It wasn't my personality in 1993 when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I would have never shouted in church. But boy, once he got a hold of me, I got to shout at me. And that shout hadn't gone out yet. I don't think it will. I had an old, an old lady who come up to me every Sunday and say, "You still got the Holy Ghost?" I'm like, "Yes, ma'am." Let me hear you speak in tongues. No, just kidding. She didn't say that. Would have been cool if she did though. I would have been like. I would have went off. All right. All right. Come on. Okay. So when they heard the sound, when they heard the sound, the crowd came together and be- bewildered them because they heard each one speaking in their own language. What is happening here? It's a reversal of what we see at Babel. Do you remember Babel? Do you remember Babel? See, at Babel, they were working. But at Pentecost, they were waiting. See, at Babel, the language was confused. But at Pentecost, the language was understood. See, at Babel, the people were scattered in judgment. At Pentecost, the people were sent to spread the good news. At Pentecost, it was for the, I'm sorry, at Babel, it was for the fame of man. But at Pentecost, it was for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. What were they doing? They were together. They were in the same place. I love that we're together today. Because when we're together, you know how it is, right? When we're together, just something happens. When we're together, we can experience it together. They were in the same place. So unity. Unity is the catalyst and the product of revival. See, what we need in America right now is not another policy, primarily. I think policies will form. What What we don't need is someone governing us from the outside. We need someone governing us from the inside. We need the Holy Ghost teaching us how to live. We need revival. See, when you have revival, you can't be racist. You can't have the Holy Ghost and be racist. You can't have revival and exercise injustice. We need revival. So they had unity and they had an upper room. What were they doing when they were together? Were they just playing poker and drinking wine? No. They were crying out to God. They were believing God for what he had promised. They were gathered around the promise of God. They're doing what we're doing. We're gathering around and we're saying, God, we're focused on you. Our attention is on you. We're focused more on you. And listen, they were in a very hostile culture. All these guys that were in that room died for their faith except for one. It was hostile, but they had one another, and they had their focus right. They weren't running around going, it's unjust, it's unjust. There wouldn't have been anything wrong with that. And hold with me. Just stay with me. But they were going around and saying, you need Jesus. Because they knew the solution wasn't another government control. What they needed was the man and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
we are so broken and divided as a nation. And once more, we've seen senseless violence. It's just, I just feel like it was kind of like enough because we've seen it and it's been building. And I, I, I think with, with George Floyd, what happened was enough. I can't breathe. I've had enough. And I don't know about you, but when I saw it, I was like, enough. I'm done with it. I don't understand. I'm a, I'm a white man. I have, a, I have black family members. I, I have, we have several black people here in our church. I love you, and I want to understand, but I can't understand. But I know when I saw that, my heart was broken. I was like, it's enough. I'm tired. And I, I have no idea what tired is, by the way. But I'm tired of it. I'm tired. But I'm, but I'm t- tired enough not just to make a post on Facebook or do a little research or research another little, you know, some other conspiracy theory or develop a political opinion about it or talk about another person because I'm tired of talking to people about the problems that they can't fix because they're sinful. There's only one person that can fix the problem, and it's God. God is the only one. Yahweh will fix it. But are we going to him like he's the solution? It's not good enough just to have a broken heart. we got to get before God. What should we do? What should we do with the injustice? I want you to do what I did. I want you to check your heart. I had to do it. Is my heart right? I remember the early 2000s, we went to the Cotton Bowl. I, I've been around minorities my whole life. I grew up. And with, with best friends that were Hispanic, really good, for, good uh, African-American young man, was really good. I've always pastored uh, minorities. You know, there's more white people here than, than I'm even comfortable with. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I get around too many white people, it's just weird. Because it's just not, it's not normal to me. But I still don't understand. But I remember the early 90s, you know, just growing up, just laughing at certain things and and saying jokes, and we went, we went to the Cotton Bowl. There was an event there, the Call Dallas, and we went. And Lou Engle got up and started talking about the problems of racism. And my, my prejudice was this. Racism doesn't really exist. That's what I thought. Yeah, there's a few little incidents, but it's not sy- systemic. And I remember God broke my heart that day. I remember weeping before the Lord, saying, Lord, I, I have never been racist, but, but, I, but I, I know that I have been prejudiced. I know that I haven't been compassionate. Check your heart, beloved. Have you wept? Have you wept? Have you prayed? I know you shared something on Facebook about it, but have you wept and have you prayed? Have you checked your heart? The second thing is love your neighbor. Love your different neighbor. Love your white trash neighbor. Come on. Love your black neighbor. Love your Asian neighbor. Love your Muslim neighbor. We got to teach our kids. Kids learn to be racist, by the way. Either by culture or by their parents. We must, fourth is this, we must posture ourselves before God with a common focus. What is the focus of my life? It's not the social issues. They need to be addressed. But the focus of my life is Jesus. The focus of my life is the gospel and getting the gospel out. The focus of my life is that every tongue and every tribe would come and bow their knee before the king of glory. That is the focus, and this is what the disciples are doing. They say, Jesus gave a commission, and we can't do it on, on our own. we got to have him come and abide in us. And then, and then we can walk out God's solution. Then we can walk it out. But have you bathed in prayer? We must address, let me say this, we must address the urgency of the hour. We must. But our strongest weapon, listen to me, our strongest weapon Our greatest weapon is not protest. I'm not saying you shouldn't protest. I think you should. I think we should all protest properly. I think first we should protest to heaven. Say, God, we're tired of this injustice. 
That's where we should protest first. We should protest. We got to stand against, ju- against injustice. But remember, it is not our greatest weapon. Because scripture tells us this, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual issue. It's a, it's a sin issue. Our nation is morally bankrupt. Our nation is morally bankrupt. Don't expect your morality to be legislated in D.C. Expect the Holy Spirit to to legislate your life, to lead your life. Our greatest weapon is this. Listen, our greatest weapon is this. Coming together, pursuing the same thing, the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our greatest weapon. And out of that, we will act. And out of that, we will respond. We're not going to react. We're going to respond because reactions don't get us very far. I love Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, we don't fight hate with hate. Come on. Oh, only love can drive out hate. And his, listen, what he did is still in play. We still got a long way to, to go. We still got a long, long way to go, but I'm so grateful. You know why his impact has remained and so many other reformers, quote-unquote reformers, haven't remained? Because he was a man that was filled with the power of spirit. He was filled with the power of the spirit. He was a man of God. He prayed first. And he led a revolution. Lord, give us more. We want more. I'll be him. I'll do whatever I have to do. I'm in. Count me in. We will not see lasting change with that. I want to share one more brief story. I know we need to be done, but listen. The father of modern Pentecost. You got to understand something. Before before the 1900s, the world was dormant of the spirit-filled life. No tongues, no healings. Come on, we, we focus so much on tongues, but it's just tinted windows. No prophecy, no no people coming up out of wheelchairs, none of that. We call those the charismatic gifts or the Pentecostal gifts. There was none of that happening, none of it. The world was dormant. And there was a son of a slave. His dad had served in the Civil War. He was a one-eyed black man. He had two eyes, but he could only see out of one of them. His name was William Seymour. And in the early 1900s, William Seymour comes to Jesus, and he got so hungry for God that he went to a segregated Bible college, a Bible school in Houston, and he would sit outside of the window and listen to the teaching. He was so hungry for God and God's Word. He would sit at the, at the door while they would teach, but because of segregation, he couldn't get inside. And he, would, he would begin to, to write and take notes and, and allow God to minister to his heart. And while he's there, he gets a phone, he gets a, a phone call. from a church in Los Angeles, they say. Brother Seymour, we want you to come to Los Angeles. We, we, we know that you've been talking about this outpouring, this second blessing called the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want you to come. And so he goes out there, and he preaches at this church for a couple of weeks, and then he shows up one day. Might have even been a couple of days. He shows up one day, and there's a padlock on the door. And they said, we don't, we don't want that message here. He was preaching Acts chapter 2. They said, we don't want you here. So he found some friends and stayed with his friend's house. He was discouraged. He had given up his life to go minister at this church. And he's at some friend's house and he's praying. And he prays some more. And four hours turn into six hours and six hours turn into to eight. Well, then other people started joining Brother Seymour in prayer. and People kept showing up to his house, and then people started getting healed, and people started getting up out of wheelchairs, and blind eyes began to see, and diseases began to go as they just began to pray and focus on God, and it got so full in the house that they, they spilled out of the house, and they started preaching out to people in the yard and up and down the street, and it was so loud and rowdy, and the, the porch would break, and they would, they would preach to the people, and the police would be called because they were so rowdy, and they tell them, you guys have to calm down a little bit. You got to calm down a little bit and they were preaching this gospel 
And they were preaching this second wave of Pentecost. And then in the midst of that, even before he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he was preaching it. And then finally he receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit and everything just explodes. And they find a building on a street called Azusa, which we now know as the great Azusa Street Revival. And William Seymour would preach Acts chapter 2 and after about three years they met day and night every single day every single night they would pray they would minister healing signs miracles wonders God would move in such a powerful way that that people people that were off in the distance even critics and stuff they'd say that church is on fire down there where they're having all those meetings that church is on fire so they call the fire department the fire department would show up because there was because people reported seeing smoke and fire at the building what was it? It was nothing other than the power of the Holy Spirit that was struck in that building. Their shouts could be heard up and down the neighborhoods. People were getting saved left and right. People of different races, people of different nationalities. That gospel went forward from that place and went and reached throughout the whole world. Even though it, that revival only lasted three years, which is a long time, the, that revival still remains. I can tell you right now, if it wasn't for William Seymour, there would be no Josh Brown. There would be no Overflow Church. Because this is the man that fathered, that partnered with God, who received the fire. And we said, Lord, I want some of that fire. I want some of that fire. Do you want some of that fire today? Do you want some of that fire today? Listen, that revival didn't stop on Azusa. That fire is here today. We need an Acts chapter 2 encounter. You need one. I need one. Will you stand with me? Listen, this is the only way. We're going to see fulfillment of what God promised Abraham. Have you experienced Pentecost? I'm not talking about you read about it. I'm not talking about you went to a Pentecostal church. Or somebody with a phone book sized Bible came trampling through your neighborhood. I'm talking about have you experienced the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized? In the Holy Spirit. Well, well how, 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 how would I know, Pastor? Oh, you'll know. Because everything will change. Everything will change. Paul in Acts chapter 19, verse 2, is in front of a bunch of believers who are loving Jesus. And he asks them this question, and I want to ask you this question today. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Have you? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit that drew you to Jesus. I'm talking about the living, abiding flame of God. The fire of heaven that gives you boldness. That gives you courage. To fulfill your end. Of the covenant. Will you just lift your hands all across this room? Lord, we need you. Thank you so much for joining us at church today. Please subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for future notifications. We pray that you have a blessed week and we can't wait to encounter Jesus with you online.